It is interesting to contemplate an entangled bank, clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth, and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other and dependent on each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. From the war of nature, from famine and death, the production of the higher animals directly follows. From so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. Denial of evolution is unique to the United States. In the video, Nye laments how many people in the United States fail to believe in evolution and asserts that this refusal is holding back the advancement of the nation. Nye acknowledges that the United States is where most technological advances are made. It's largely because of the intellectual capital we have, the, the general understanding of science but never seems to consider how that acknowledgement undermines his thesis that the American refusal to fully embrace evolution is somehow holding us back in technology and as voting citizens. We need scientifically literate voters and taxpayers for the future. We need people that can, uh, we need engineers that can build stuff, solve problems. When you have a portion of the population that doesn't believe in that, it holds everybody back. Really. So Nye says we need scientifically literate voters and taxpayers and the engineers who can build stuff and solve problems as though somehow engineers out there don't solve anything unless they believe in evolution. I want my engineers to understand engineering. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. First he defines accepting evolution as sort of a litmus test for whether you're scientifically literate. Then he says that people who deny evolution hinder the progress of society. And of course this is all nonsense. I don't know if Bill Nye really believes that is true, but it's certainly a nonsensical view which sounds like a political talking point. Evolution is the fundamental idea in all of life science. Not to mention using the word evolution as a catch-all term makes it so that it seems as though people are denying any and all things that might be under the evolution umbrella when they might actually be objecting to other more specific things like the materialist worldview. Now, we have to distinguish. Evolution, in my view, is absolutely true. There is evolution. There's tons of evidence for evolution, right? The fossil record, the geological record, on and on. Historical evolution also comes into play. But Darwin is a whole different kettle of fish. Divide the question of evolution from the question of Darwin. The big weakness of Darwin is the so-called blind watchmaker. Blind chance on its own is no kind of watchmaker. But chance with natural selection, chance smeared out into innumerable tiny steps over aeons of time, is powerful enough to manufacture miracles like dinosaurs and ourselves. What many people don't realize is that Darwin never addressed the question of the origin of the first life. And in 150 years since then, uh, scientists have been unsuccessful in explaining this the, the origin of the code and the origin of this chicken and egg relationship. DNA encodes for proteins, but proteins are necessary to read the information on DNA, and it's hard to imagine one without the other. You have billions of this machine right now whirring away inside you, copying your DNA with exquisite fidelity. It's an accurate representation, and it's pretty much at the correct speed at what is occurring inside you. But I've left out error correction and a bunch of other things. This is something called an ATP synthase. It's a little energy generating turbine. It runs on the same principle as a hydroelectric dam. There is a rotor inside a stator that cranks a shaft and creates torque, which is then stored as energy and is used to create a little battery pack, a chemical battery pack that gives the energy for everything inside the cell. This is, by the way, in the mitochondria of your cells. You have these little, these little turbines operating right now. They're keeping you alive. Whereas we thought that only a minority of the, the genome was doing something, namely that minority which actually codes for protein. Um, uh, and, and now we find that, that actually the majority of it's doing something. What it's doing is calling into, into action the protein coding genes. So you can think of the protein coding genes as being the sort of toolbox of subroutines, which is pretty much common to all mammals. I mean, all mice and men have the same number, roughly speaking, of protein-coding genes, and that's always been 
a, a bit of a blow to the self-esteem of humanity. <laughs> but what the point is, that that was just the subroutines that are called into being. The program that's calling them into action is, is, the, is the, the rest which had previously been written off as junk. So the whole genomic system is immensely complicated. And it's an integrated complexity, the kind that an engineer would design. But I think natural selection also fails to explain some of the higher orders of form and complexity we see in higher animals, not just the first cell. With a multicellular organism, the cells that are part of that aggregate of cells now no longer are having as their goal their own survival, but the goal is the survival of the organism. And so to go from a single-celled organism to a multicellular organism requires some fairly sophisticated changes in the biochemistry of cells. The cell division in the cell growth cycle has to be coordinated with other cells. You'd have to have a mechanism for the cells becoming specialized because the cells will take on different roles to sustain the different tissues that form organs. There has to be a means for controlled cell death. This is called apoptosis, where during the course of the life of that organism, individual cells willingly die for the betterment of the organism at large. So there's a complex ensemble of biochemical and cell biological changes that have to happen where that single-celled organism is essentially operating in a completely different paradigm in order for a multicellular organism to exist. The first animal that is believed to have existed that would be a multicellular organism would be something similar to a sponge that really is not much more than a colonial aggregate of cells where there is very limited specialization of those cells to form the organism. Even though the sponge doesn't need a sophisticated collection of genetic networks to sustain its form of multicellularity because it's a relatively simple organism in that sense, the framework needed for later on to support complex multicellularity is already present within the sponge. So it's a much more complex system, genetically speaking, than anybody would have thought. Dawkins has written an entire book really expanding on Darwin's contention here. And his point is that the Darwinian mechanism is a way of getting up what he calls Mount Improbable. Sitting on the top of the mountain is equivalent to being very well designed, to being an eye that works very well, for example. Jumping from the bottom of the cliff to the top corresponds to assembling a 747 by means of a hurricane or it corresponds to getting a complete eye in a single lucky mutation. It can't be done. You can no more do that than a mountaineer could leap from the bottom of a, of a cliff to the top. But this isn't the only route up Mount Improbable. We have to go round the other side. And so the idea, and I think it's a brilliant idea of Darwinian theory, is that you could break down what is a seemingly vast improbability into a series of manageable probabilistic steps and thereby get to the top of Mount Improbable. It would be nice if it worked, but I want to suggest to you that it doesn't. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Natural selection has to find something that's working at least a little bit and then improve it a little bit and then select that in the next generation or many generations and then improve it a little bit more. One can point out irreducible complexity in many biological systems and show that they can't be approached in the step-by-step -step gradual manner that Darwin envisioned for natural selection working on, on a biological system. These things cannot be formed by numerous successive slight modifications, and so we have good reason to think that Darwin's theory has in fact broken down. Hitchens is obsessed with the human eye. Observing different types of eyes in nature, he repeats the chestnut that natural selection gradually has turned a light-sensitive spot into a full-fledged camera eye. No mention that eyes have to be built in embryological development, or that eyes are only as good as their associated neural processing. No details from about the genetic changes that would be needed to affect such a transformation. And it's not just that Hitchens doesn't provide that, nobody provides that when they tell these stories about how the eye evolved.
Well, there's two senses of change here. One is the kind of things that we observe, which are mutations. But those types of changes tend to degrade the information, mm -hmm. and, and they don't seem to be an explanation for where it came from in the first place as a result. The other kind of change is the change you see in the history of life when you see these sudden infusions of new biological form. And we now know, just like in the computer world, if you want to give your computer a new function, you have to provide new code. If you have a new organism that performs new kinds of biological functions, you also need code. And that's the big question. Where did all that information come from? At the top of the screen is the target phrase in green, and he thinks it is like a weasel. And at the bottom are the random tries of our computer monkey. And that's changing completely at random. There's no sense to that at all, just random letters of the alphabet are being chosen. And that'll go on for millions of years, unless a miracle happens. In the middle is a line labeled Darwin. And that line is changing at random, but every time a letter changes in such a way that the phrase is a little bit more like the target phrase, and he thinks it is like a weasel, then that phrase is bred from. We breed from that phrase, make children from it. And so as the generations go by, that phrase, Darwin, becomes progressively, cumulatively, more like the target phrase, he thinks it is like a weasel. What's the fallacy in that, though? Is that... I'm not sure it's a fallacy, because uh, obviously his theory is correct. It's simply not Darwinian. It's really a bit of a cheat, because this program is homing in on a distant target, and he thinks it is like a weasel. It's looking into the future. Real evolution is blind to the future. He's selecting for future function, not actual function. There's that's, no that's actual right. function it's, being selected. It's, He's selecting it's all for, taking place in the future. In the future. In the future. As if the computer somehow knows, which, of course, natural selection doesn't know. No. We have looked at uh, three different algorithms, Avita, EV, and, of course, the Dawkins weasel one. And we found out that, strikingly, that they are not responsible for any creation of information. And, and in fact, I believe in the Dover trial, uh, one of the testimonies concerned at Avita mm -hmm. as a proof of evolution, and indeed it is not. Here's a problem for natural selection. The claims that are made on its behalf are rarely backed up with evidential support. Think about what you would want a theory of evolution to do. You wouldn't be content with that theory if it just explained to you why one moth had slightly more pigment in its wing than another moth. You want to know where did the moth itself come from? The founders of textbook evolutionary theory said, let's assume that micro or small scale evolution and macro or large scale evolution are the same. Just add time to micro and you'll get macro. Richard Dawkins will make a claim like this, but if you actually go to the biological literature and look for the evidence where natural selection actually is shown to be causally effective in building eyes or ears or brains or wings or nervous systems, it's just not there. And right now, if you go to an evolutionary biology meeting, as I do, with regularity, you will find people talking about this. It doesn't make its way into PBS specials or into textbooks or into the public face of science, but believe me, it's quite real. Natural selection alone is not sufficient. It may explain the survival of the fittest, but it cannot explain the arrival of the fittest. I would particularly appeal to my scientific colleagues, most of whom are atheists. If you look at the members of the National Academy of Sciences, about 90% of them are non-believers, an exact mirror image of the official figures of the country at large. If you look at the Royal Society of London, the equivalent for the British Commonwealth, again, about 90% of them are atheists. I want to put on the table not why 85% of the National Academy rejects God. I want to know why 15% don't. And that's really the, what we got to address here. Otherwise, the public is, is secondary to this. We are losing our freedom in one of the most important sectors of society, science. I have always assumed that scientists were free to ask any question, to pursue any line of inquiry without fear of reprisal. But recently, I've been alarmed to discover that this is not the case. The Ben Stein movie, Expelled, accuses the scientific establishment of conspiring to keep the stalwart intelligent design scientists from holding jobs and sharing their groundbreaking ideas.
Quite possibly the reason why intelligent design has not been accepted in the scientific community is because it's just really bad science, but that's not the position that's being taken in an expelled meeting. Any scientific explanation has to be testable. There must be possible observational consequences that could support the idea, but also ones that could refute it. Unless a proposed explanation is framed in a way that some observational evidence could potentially count against it, that explanation cannot be subjected to scientific testing. Intelligent design is not a scientific concept because it cannot be empirically tested. I think that's just the opposite of the truth. Uh, intelligent design is very open to falsification. I claim, for example, that the bacterial flagellum could not be produced by natural selection. It needed to be deliberately, intelligently designed. Well, all a scientist has to do to prove me wrong is to take a bacterium without a flagellum or knock out the genes for the flagellum in a bacterium, go into his lab and grow that bug for a long time and see if it produces anything resembling a flagellum. If that happened, Intelligent design, as I understand it, would be uh, knocked out of the water. Now, I certainly don't expect it to happen, but it's easily falsified by a series of such experiments. Now let's turn that around and ask, how do we falsify the contention that natural selection produced the bacterial flagellum? If that same scientist went into the lab and knocked out the bacterial flagellum genes and grew the bacterium for a long time and nothing much happened, well, he'd say, well, maybe we didn't start with the right bacterium. Maybe we didn't wait long enough. Maybe we need a bigger population. And it would be very much more difficult to falsify the Darwinian hypothesis. I haven't seen a case of natural selection making an organism change from one species to another species. Neither have I, because we don't live long enough, bro. We don't live long enough. I think the very opposite is true. I think intelligent design is easily testable, easily falsifiable although it has not been falsified. And uh, Darwinism is very resistant to being falsified. They can always uh, claim some, something was not right. The argument from design has no formal logical defect. Its premises are empirical, and its conclusion professes to be reached in accordance with the usual canons of empirical inference. The question whether it is to be accepted or not turns therefore not on general metaphysical questions, but on comparatively detailed considerations. Is there nothing that biological systems can exhibit that would point you to an intelligence, something beyond... Absolutely Darwinian nothing. Absolutely well, in, nothing. In that case, how do you have a scientific theory? Because there's nothing that can refute it.